Uh, welcome to our second uh, meetup of the CMX Connect chapter for chapter and user group uh, program managers, leaders, uh, people are, that are involved. Uh, so this is our welcome uh, section. And then we will go directly to our three presenters. Each will speak about uh, about 10 minutes about onboarding processes for leaders and new groups that they have uh, in their um, organizations. Uh, so we have Sam Cherner, um, an associate director at Net Impact, Erica Moss, senior manager community engagement at Legion, and Neve Gori, um, EMA, a community manager at Slack. After their talks, we will do a Q&A. So please, if you have questions during their talk, uh, drop it in the Q&A chat. And then when we go to the questions, uh, everyone will be able just to pop in onto the conversation and ask by themselves the question. Um, and after the Q&A, we will have like free discussion. It's like the last half an hour because we're doing one hour, the, uh, the talks and the Q&A. And then the last half an hour, just general discussion. If you have any issues you want to bring up, uh, following our last meeting, just questions related to uh, user groups and chapters program in general it doesn't have to be connected uh, with today's topic. Uh, so some things before that, this is this event is recorded. So if you have any issues with appearing um, with camera, just um, a heads up. Uh, please join the CMX Slack ch channel uh, for chapter programs to continue the, the conversation there uh, after the meetup and before the next event. And uh, Please make sure you join to our CMX Connect um, group. That th this way you will uh, get updates for the next um, next events that we are doing. And the photo stuff we already took it. So I'm going back to see you now. Fantastic. Um, great. Uh, just like one qu qu request. Um, I know that usually people also like during the talks, uh, doing um, conversation on the chat, which is fantastic. But if you have a question or something, uh, just to make sure that everyone can enjoy from the answer and the discussion, if you can keep it and ask it live uh, after the talks. So let's start with um, Erica. Awesome. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Uh, pumped to be here, pumped to talk about onboarding, to be honest, because I think it is such an essential part of definitely the like uh, ambassador program at Atlassian, but just in general, like setting your folks up to succeed, I think is so important and such a great way to prevent churn down the road. Um, I do have like four slides, which I would love to um, share with y'all right now. Please don't judge me for the amount of icons I have on my desktop. The life of a community manager is one of screenshots galore. <laughs> so let me hit play on her. Are y'all able to see that okay? Yes. Fabulous. So let's talk about onboarding for the win, setting people up to succeed. Um, and when I'm talking about my people, you know, the folks that I'm onboarding on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm talking about the Atlassian community leaders. And these are folks who wear all different types of hats. So some of these folks host events on our behalf. Some of these folks are very active in our online community, answering questions, writing articles, starting discussions. And then we have some folks who actually wear both of those hats. So they're an events leader and an online leader and they're kind of uh, our unicorns. And right now we have about 420 of them. Uh, that is a lot of humans. I am not responsible for all of them. We have a wonderful team of community managers at Atlassian who are sort of able to divvy up that crew. So I have about 150 folks um, who I'm in charge of, of nurturing and, and keeping happy. So I just kind of wanted to set the stage in that way in terms of um, who I'm talking about when I'm talking about onboarding. And I kind of wanted to preface this talk also by, you know, we all start somewhere. So when I first started on the community team, we did not have this beautiful streamlined process <laughs> that I'm about to, to show you today. Like it was very manual, you know, we're talking Google Sheets and Confluence pages, you know, cherry picking, hand picking folks to join this program. Like, again, we all start somewhere. So you know, I hope that what I share with you today is 
is inspirational, but I also hope that there are things that no matter the size of your program or organization, you're able to sort of take with you and uh, implement in your day to day. So basically what you're seeing right now is a screenshot of our landing page and it is beautiful. I wrote the copy for it. It was a labor of love. And this is kind of where we send all folks who are interested in joining the program. And on this page, we're very intentional about laying out exactly what it takes to be a good candidate for this program. I think um, a lot of times with ambassador programs, it can be tough to filter folks. So maybe you're getting applications that are less than stellar, you know, people who aren't a good fit. So we really wanted to be wildly specific about the type of person we're looking for. So that's what this really does. It helps us establish credibility as like a real you know, program within the Atlassian community and then sets those expectations from, from the jump. And then once you've read everything on the page, you're like, okay, great, I'm a superstar. I'm ready to raise my hand uh, and jump in. You can hit the apply now button. You get to this um, quite lengthy application form, I would say. And again, that is super intentional, super thoughtful. We want to create sort of a barrier to entry there. Like if you can't take, you know, five or 10 minutes to fill out an application form, you know, maybe you don't have sort of the grit and the endurance for, for the actual program, but it really captures all of the information that we need right now, but also information that we want to capture and have for the future. And when I say that, I mean stuff like what Atlassian products are you using? Like maybe that's not super important um, right out of the gate, but as we go along, we want to know what type of product expert you are. So again, kind of a lengthy application form, but um, I think it really gets at the nitty gritty of, of what we're looking for. It gets at, you know, why are you applying? How did you hear about the program? You know, really all of that stuff in addition to like name, birthday, like all of that stuff. And once you submit your application, it comes into our uh, back end in Salesforce. Uh, we have not always been in Salesforce, but this was something that we moved to, I guess, probably like a year and a half ago now, maybe two years. And it's been a really wonderful way not only to sort of see applications at a glance, but also see uh, where folks are at sort of in the leader journey. So in this example that you see on the screen, Cassie is a new application. You know, she's pumped about the program. She's sharing all of her, you know, ideas and excitement. But then we also have folks who have been accepted as leaders in here, you know, folks who have been leaders for three or four years. And so it makes reporting really easy. And we can see sort of where folks are at uh, in each stage of the life cycle. Uh, so once we have folks, they've submitted an application, they've come into our queue, um, they're sort of divvied up by geography. So I'm focused mostly on the Americas. So anyone who comes in uh, in that geo will land in, in my inbox, in my queue. And I take a look at the application and I make sure that it looks great. You know, did they cross all their T's and dot their I's? Um, if it is an online leader, so someone who's really focused on answering questions and writing articles, we then take that application and we submit it to our support team. So our support team can take a look at that person's online activity and say, you know, yes, Mary Ramirez is striking the proper voice and tone. She is giving answers that are technically accurate, all of that kind of stuff. So we do sort of have that filter in the process where like, even if you're excited and you're into it, you may not necessarily be accepted if you aren't able to pass that support review part of, of the process. And then on the event side, we actually try to, if the candidate looks good, looks like they have good intentions, we will set up an onboarding call with them. So we will hop on, hop on a video chat. I can see that you're not a robot. You can see that I'm not a robot. Um, and we'll, ru we'll run through some like FAQs and answer any questions they might have. It's a great way to sort of learn folks' intentions and make sure that they're, you know, in it for the right reasons. Um, so that's, that's another nice way to really uh, look at folks and decide if they're a good fit. 
And then, you know, once you've passed the support review, once you've hopped on a call with us, you know, if you're on the event side, that's when the onboarding sort of kicks in. And the checklist that you see in front of you right now represents the old version <laughs> of this process. And I think when you're a new member of a program like this, the last thing you want to do is be like inundated or overwhelmed by a bunch of noise or a bunch of things that like maybe you don't need to care about, you know, at this exact point in time. So about a year and a half or so ago, we took a step back and we were like, how can we streamline and simplify this? Because right now it's a giant confluence page and we're getting feedback that it's like a bit overwhelming. So magic, ta-da. This is sort of the modern day version of the Confluence checklist. I absolutely stole this template from <laughs> the Atlassian new hire team. Uh, they had set this up for new folks who were joining Atlassian and I thought it was such a brilliant way to make the onboarding process a little more digestible. So what you see here is sort of a, a start here column, all of your need to knows, all of your like special links, all of our like meet the team stuff, that's sort of your home base for that. And then the rest of the Trello board is organized by time frame. So if I'm a new leader, I know that I only have to worry about the stuff that's on the week one list right now. And I can sort of put the rest of it, you know, on the back burner for the time being. And I think it's just really wonderful to see it chunked out that way because, you know, again, it, it prevents folks from feeling too overwhelmed. And you'll notice that we do have activities and tasks for both events leaders and online leaders uh, on the same board. And again, we did that very thoughtfully, very intentionally, because we want folks to sort of be able to envision what a hybrid type role would look like, right? Like maybe if you're joining as an events leader, you have no idea what's happening on the online side of the house, but that's something we want to expose you to. You know, we want you to, to know about the possibilities. So again, the Trello board is beautiful. It's, it meets you sort of where you're at in the leader journey. And again, it shows, it shows folks all the ways that they can get involved. Uh, and then in addition to sort of the onboarding Trello board, which is again, the one-stop shop, you know, where folks keep track of their progress, we have some other resources that we add folks to during the onboarding process. So this is an example of a, the confluence space that we have for leaders. So this has more like nitty gritty, like links to things. Um, if you want to read guidelines, if you want to learn about how to earn free certifications as a community leader, this is really where you go for some of the, the nitty gritty stuff. And a lot of this is linked from the Trello board, but this is sort of another way where you can um, have all of the documentation in one place. And then again, because everything is built on a Trello board, <laughs> we also have another board here. Uh, when events leaders are onboarding, they are added to this wonderful repository of content that they can use at their events. So again, thinking about if I'm a new leader, I'm excited about hosting events, but if I don't know anything about my members, maybe I have no idea where to start and what content to bring to the table for that first event. So this board kind of removes some of the guesswork and folks, again, can cherry pick things that they're interested in, things that they can start with, um, and it's organized by product. So if you were to scroll right on this Trello board, you would see Trello, Jira, Bitbucket, like depending on, on your needs. So it's, it's packaged and it's ready to go and it's, it's amazing. And then finally, sort of the, you know, this is a real program <laughs> offering. We send each new leader a welcome kit. So this is something physical, something tangible that they can hang on to that really welcomes them to the program. And it's a wonderful thing to share on social, right? So folks are taking a picture of the welcome kit. You know, they're sharing them with their LinkedIn networks. And you never know when that might pique the interest of, of someone else who's an Atlassian enthusiast. And may not have known that this program exists, but now they do because, you know, a colleague or friend has shared this photo. And that is 
it from my side. I feel like I like ran through that so quick and dirty, but <laughs> that's the highlight reel for me. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have some questions. Uh, Aaron, do you want to go? Sure, I can read that. Um, so love the Trello board. We're doing something kind of similar for ourselves, but we're trying to figure out how to automate it. And I'm just wondering how your incoming leaders interact with the board, if they move through it in any way, um, or if it's mostly just static there for reference. Yeah, so we ask folks when, because they receive a copy of that template board, obviously, but then we encourage them to make a copy of it that is their own so that they can actually create like a done column and show that they are actually checking things off, moving things along. Um, one of the items on one of the lists, I think it's like the 30 day list, we do ask them at that point to set up a call with us as their community manager. And that's kind of a nice, just like check-in point, pulse check, like how are we doing kind of thing. So there are certain like milestones within, but yeah, we do ask them to create their own copy and track their progress that way. Cause it's fun to move stuff to Don. Like we love doing that. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually forgot that we wanted to move on to the next presenter and then have the Q&A in the end. I apologize. Okay. Uh, I was uh, very excited. I will add my questions, so I won't forget them. So, uh, Niv, do you want to go? Your turn? Yeah, you're here. Hi, it's a last minute panic update of slides. So hang on, let me share my screen. I also have one million tabs open. And for anybody who's familiar with Bevy Ritual, it's so good that you're able to present from within tab, but not when you have 30 plus tabs leaning towards 40, 50 and are trying to sift out which one is which. So bear with me. Are we able to see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. All right. I only have a very limited amount of slides, but then I'll, I'll talk you through how things work. So, greetings, everybody from Slack platform community. I'm Neve Gary, and I'm based in decidedly not sunny Dublin, Ireland. So, our team is a grand total of two people. There is myself based in Dublin, and then my manager Elizabeth, who started the community. And she's based in San Francisco. And then our purpose of our Slack community, it's where all of our most passionate users collaborate together, build stuff together. And I've getting all the stories of how people like have built their own businesses from meeting on Slack platform community. But also this idea where like passionate users can just hang out with one another, share the stuff that they've built, ask those questions that they're not too sure how to answer. Maybe it's something to do with code and the people around them are not too sure what the answer is. A place where our developers can also come and hang out with others and hopefully up level skills. So yeah, we look at it as being a place to connect, share, learn, and grow. And it's just simply slackcommunity.com. Notice it was started in 2019 with the first in real life event shortly afterwards in Berlin. So yeah, actually it was the two year anniversary of Slack community just um, two months ago. So I find the numbers very impressive for something that went from absolutely zero to now well, you'll come to this next slide. But yeah, just one of those like nostalgic moments. Look at how fun an event was in Berlin in person soon. Soon we might be doing that again. So yeah, now where are the numbers at? Well, we have over 9,000 numbers. It's actually about 10,000, but I don't want to lie. So we'll say 10,000 members, 9,900 and something. We have over 100 volunteer leaders. So our chapters are split up into city-based chapters, which of course made sense when people were meeting up in person. We've been like doing, trialing out some stuff while we're in the virtual world, but yeah, it's city-based volunteer leaders and each city has its own chapter. And yeah, 90 plus chapters, so very global. Also a surprise for me when I first started working in community was just a, an assumption that I thought it would weigh, weight uh, heavily towards the US and perhaps Canada, but no, nah, fully global representation all over. And yeah, based in 40 countries, I think it's nearly 50 as well. And yeah, meet up locally. So I just wanted to show 
some of the array of people that we're working with who are chapter leaders and then talk to you about uh, the process it was for onboarding them. But even here, like I'm just seeing chapter leaders just like looking at like Accra, Vienna, Azerbaijan, um, other people in the few in Germany, so they're in Hamburg and also in Munich. So it's a nice, very, very mixed um, chapter chapters and community group where some people here are really, really technical because it did originally start off as being a platform community. So it was quite tech and dev heavy, but now that's really expanded. Some people, especially um, just like I was a lot of people based in EMEA, are more so experienced in like discussing thought leadership. So really the community has changed from being developer heavy to now all inclusive, all encapsulating, well blown community. So just to talk to you, I'll, I'll go off and let me stop sharing for the moment and just talk to you about this. So what we've done is on Slack community, that's where people can apply to be chapter leaders. So maybe they're already part of a community group. I know actually, Erica, that a lot of our chapter leaders, I think, are actually quite active in the Atlassian community groups as well. There's this fair bit of crossover going on. Uh, what we have is just like people volunteer to apply. Similar as Erica was saying, it's a lengthy enough process to fill out. It's not also the world's nicest thing. I'm actually kind of glad that I didn't include a screenshot of it. It's a, a janky ad Google questionnaire. It, but it, things are actually getting, actually, uh, just so you know, Slack community is getting a, a revamp. So things will look a bit slicker very shortly, but uh, not yet. So currently undergoing the renovations and makeover. But yeah, once people have applied, basically what we do is we try to get back to them within a maximum of 10 day window. That way like we're trying to keep the momentum going. And what we'll do is like we'll split it up. If it's somebody in North America, Elizabeth will take it. If it's an EMEA, I'll take it. Or if it's APAC, that's more of a variable. It'll be whoever sees it first takes it. And then we just go through their answers and see has somebody filled out a fully fledged application form? Most of the time, yeah, because if you've gotten that far, you're being inclined rather than just giving up. But we go through it and then anybody, and most of the time we'll go to this, is to try and get people on a call. So let's meet face to face. So less so whether you're trying to see if people are robots, just more seeing that like, do you have realistic expectations for the community groups? Because like, one of the best things, but also one of the more frustrating things as a community manager, when you're working with volunteer leaders, and it's it's such a, it's gonna sound absolutely like misery guts. We want people to be realistic because of course, when like we know as people who work with community, it takes time to build out your community. Getting to these levels of hundreds of people or even the thousands of people, that's consistent work. Whereas all of our volunteers, they have their own jobs. They have their own careers to be focusing on and to know like what their balance is going to be of how much time they can commit. So what we're trying to talk them through is that like our ask is for minimum four events per year. So that should be like one per quarter uh, or however they see fit, depending on their own schedule. And also then just trying to talk them into like what we expect for community numbers. And like sometimes we meet people who are like, I would be really happy if, and this was an example from the Barcelona chapter, is like if I could talk to like, two or three, four people within the Barcelona area who learned something and got better at Slack, I'd be delighted. And I was like, yeah. Because then I also had conversely um, for a chapter leader in Mumbai, he was like, I think I could get a thousand people to our first event. I was like, okay, this is brilliant that you're so excited, but uh, might take a little bit of work to get to that point. So really it's just trying to talk them through that. Like, we will help you when it comes to promoting your events, but you need to give us like three weeks notice because I can't do it myself. I have to go to our, our email campaigns team and they can pull the resources, they can send out emails, but they need time to process that. So really it's just trying to manage the expectations, keep their excitement up, but I'm also just conscious because it happens when people are so excited and then they don't see 150 people to 1000 people at their first event, that people can get very deflated. And I want them to keep feeling like, no, one of the things you can think of is your first event, that can be your training ground. You're getting used to Bevy virtual. You're getting to see what are the different networks that are like most popular with the people you want to attract to your event. So that's really what our interview call is like, talking through, getting to know them and setting expectations. Then once like, it's all been passed, they do sign an agreement saying that they will indeed host four events. Give or take, of course, the last year, 
kind of skewed how many events people could realistically hold and they also their excitement level for it because you know well we all know but it was a bit of a depressing one so they were trying to ask for four events but really up to them and then the next stage is trying to keep them and that excitement going so just show you this is one of the most hideous slides i've ever pulled so you're going to have to forgive me uh, but just to show you so like once somebody has been welcomed in they've passed everything we send them a big old email including all the links to our resources but also of course because it's slack oh yeah and it's also because i use dark mode that this is horrific looking but yeah they get invited into a leadership channel and this leadership channel means that they're going to be able to speak directly to elizabeth and i at any point so this means that like we're always going to be active in the channel but also we have a pinned post of all of resources for their guidebook, suggestions of how they should maintain their profile, workflow so that they can introduce themselves to also our other leaders in leadership channels, and then pin posts and information again, just these very leader specific ones so that people can immediately start networking within, um, within their region. We have some split us like there's the India leaders, there's the EMEA leaders, there's the US leaders, Canada leaders, etc. And then just also global leaders where people can get to know people across the globe and yeah that's where we keep all of the research I'll stop because I'm even embarrassed to be shown it to you then after that what we try and do is have it as just being 90 days as being that's kind of what we want their first event to be in and of course like life does get in the way but I try and suggest you know hosting your first event within 90 days so read through all the guidebook material then book a call with us and that's when we can help you get that first event going. Do you need a speaker? Do you have a theme going? If you need a speaker from Slack, I'll find you one. So trying to help them as best we can to like make their event come to life so that they can get comfortable with all the tools at hand. And 90 days, it's, like, it's just one of those things, if it goes beyond, generally people might have forgotten that they signed up to this or it's just, you know, to the wayside a bit. But within 90 days, hopefully, usually best case scenarios within the first few weeks, or a month or so, that's when we're going to really glean and capture their excitement and get that momentum going. So then as it continues, we keep using those leadership channels. That's where like, we'll share all the insider news if we're looking for beta testers for things, or if there's like, um, like developer advisory board meetups coming up and other events that might be of interest, that's where we keep them and just try and keep that Slack workspace for our community as active and information filled as possible. So it's really, our onboarding process. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, very insightful. Now we will go to Sam and then we will open the QA for uh, everyone. And I hope that I will not have problems with my chat. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks for having me for this. Um, so I'm going to share a few slides, but they're mostly to help provide context. And then I'll talk through the processes. So I work for Net Impact. We are a global nonprofit and we work with a community of students and professionals interested in using their skills and careers to make a difference in the world. So a little bit different, um, but we are organized in chapters. And so that is how we exist. And so here, ooh, I think, okay, can people see that? Can I get like a nod or a thumbs up or something? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so here is a little bit about our chapters. Um, our, our chapters are sort of the local embodiment of our community. So they're local, like-minded communities of students and professionals committed to driving social and environmental impact. So we have chapters at undergraduate institutions, at graduate institutions, and professional chapters that are based in cities. What do our chapters do? All kinds of things. Uh, they host events and programs that create opportunities for members. Um, and that can take a lot of forms. These are just some big buckets of the things that they do. So um, chapters are often focused on advancing members' careers, learning about new social or environmental impact issues, building skills, connecting to the global network, and also connecting to the local network that's there, and then also making a local impact. And the form that that can take is really going to vary a lot from chapter to chapter. Uh, here are two tiny examples. 
Uh, one, we have a chapter in San Francisco, right near where our headquarters is based is Oakland. Um, and this, of course, is all from when there were events. Uh, this is highlighting an event that they did on socially responsible investing. Uh, we also have a chapter in Gambia uh, that held a workshop to equip attendees um, around advocacy campaigns um, focused on environmental issues. So two very different uh, geographical contexts and two very different types of events, um, just as, as different examples of what chapters do. Uh, this is the quick thing about like where they are. We have roughly 400 chapters in about 40 countries. This changes a little bit. And there are about 2,000 leaders of those chapters. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing and sort of explain this a little bit. So uh, I think the easiest way, the way I think about this is we're sort of a distributed model. And so Net Impact, our, our headquarters office, works with the leadership of those 400 chapters. And then they work with their members. So there are times that we as the headquarters have direct interaction with members through our events and our program offerings and our conference and stuff like that. Um, but most of our work is with those 2,000 people who represent the leadership teams of those chapters. Um, and so that's important just like conceptually to understand and also means that we have two different onboarding processes, one for new leaders and one for new chapters. And I'll talk through both of those. So um, for new leaders, because of our model, those the, the chapters are essentially self-perpetuating. Um, they're like a nonprofit board, or like if you think about when, where you went to undergrad or grad school, if you went and were involved in a club, it's like that in most cases. So the outgoing leadership team is working to select the incoming leadership team. And so basically what happens is they do that in their process. We have suggestions around that, but to a certain extent, that's up to them. And then they let us know. There's basically a form that they fill out that says, hello, uh, I am outgoing leader ABC. Here's the information for incoming leaders D, E, and F. Um, and so we uh, actually manually process that information because of how precious it is and uh, that it is that direct link that we have. We sort of verify that. So we'll check that, you know, that outgoing person actually is from that specific chapter, stuff like that. Then that gets updated in our database and we use Salesforce for that. Um, and then they get a series of welcome emails. And so we have, oh wait, let me try to share this again. Chrome tab. Uh oh. Oh no, I'm gonna have the same thing if I have 100 gazillion Chrome tabs. Here we go. Um, we have a, uh, what we call the chapter leader hub and it's basically a collection of resources and so this is just the home page there's a ton of information here there's a video of me if you really want to listen to me talk some more there's this is like an accordion section of resources that opens up for different things and i'll just pick one here that's like around leadership teams and succession planning so there's more information here and then an additional video about this and so our basic goal is to push new leaders to this resource page as much as possible. So they uh, go into an email drip campaign um, that sends them a set of emails. I think they get four emails in the first two weeks, roughly, and then it tones down. Um, and it's basically like pointing out different things that are all on that resource section. Because the idea is like, Yes, we want them to click on those specific things, but we also want them to know that that is the place that you go to get all of your stuff. Um, we also have a, a Slack community and a couple other things that you need to be a leader to get access to. And so some of those emails will note those and tell people how, they, how to register. Um, that email drip campaign actually lasts for a year. Um, it basically goes on hiatus for a while and then roughly a year, a little bit less than a year um, after the person has gone in as a leader, uh, it basically sends out a check-in email that's like, hey, most of our leaders uh, are essentially on their leadership team for about a year, which is true. If you think most of our chapters are based at our students, and so the turnover rate is generally about a year. Um, so they get an email that says, hey, it's been about a year, 
here's some resources and things to think about if you are transitioning to a new team. And as a reminder, here is how to let us know about a new team whenever that happens. We only started this 12 months ago. So we're now getting to the first batch of people that are getting to that one year point. So we're now watching and are going to tinker with that with that email engagement campaign. But that that is how it's how it's set out. So that is for leaders of chapters. Uh, new chapters is a little complicated. So we've actually paused on starting new chapters for a little bit more than a year. Um, basically, when COVID started, we said we want to focus the resources that we have on our existing community. Um, we've made a very small number of exceptions. I think we've started maybe five or six chapters. Uh, we would we would probably normally be talking about something more like 70 in a year or something like that. Um, and so what we've done is we've built a system that's going to uh, roughly automate to a large extent how we bring in new chapters. Um, and so the way that it's it's going to work is there will be a page with a bunch of information about how to start a chapter, um, including a video that you need to watch. You watch the video, you put in your email address, and then you get sent a link for the actual application itself. Um, and then as you fill out the application, you'll go through a bunch of stages. Um, and at a certain point toward the end, our staff will basically sign off on that and say, like, yes, we think this makes sense to be a chapter. There isn't a conflicting chapter already there, or whatever the case may be. Um, and then they have to sign an agreement and complete an orientation call. And those are the steps to get them to that point. And much of that will be um, controlled through our database. So, like, once the status of the chapter changes from, you know, we received piece A, we need piece B. Uh, our system will automatically send out an email to that person that says, um, here's where we are. So the goal is to automate a large a large portion of that. And we've been able to use this past year to sort of build that system. And it's very close to being done. I would normally have a slide about that, but like it's not actually done. And we keep moving around bits of the process as we like learn about how our different systems can talk to each other and can't talk to each other in some cases. But that is the that is the rough flow for for new chapters when we turn that on again, which we're hoping will be probably in the next few months at some point. Okay. That was a lot. So but that that is the end of my two pieces of new uh, onboarding new leaders and then onboarding new chapters. Thank you, Sammy. It took me a minute to, um, to, to like to, to understand the difference because there's definitely there are people that are um, um, changing with time and existing chapters. Uh, but when you have a new program like me, so it, it's it's not where not yet in them a massive amount. Thank you very much. So so now uh, it's time to ask questions. Um, Elijah, I like the sharing the uh, the playbooks. We will do that. Uh, it's a very it's a great idea uh, and I just shared the, the playbook for chapter guides um, so okay I'm going to take a look on the Q&A chats so uh, Elsa do you want to ask your question do you want me to read it sure uh, so my question was for Erica um, I was really interested in the kind of prepackaged event content that you provide to uh, your leaders and you know, partly because I'm I'm working on doing something similar this coming quarter, but I'm having a really hard time of figuring out how to strike that balance between really enabling chapter leaders to be efficient and spin up meetings quickly, but still provide really unique and valuable content for the community so they're not seeing the same types of meetings, especially while we're virtual and they can kind of tune in to any meeting anywhere. So how, how how do you um, kind of balance the unique content with the um, streamlined streamlined uh, process? It is a great question because it is a delicate balance, right? And to your point, in a virtual world, everything is democratized. So. I can attend an event in Bangalore simply because I'm interested in the topic. So it's hard to say like how often folks are actually pulling from that Trello board. I think when we think about like 
version two of that, it is set up in a way where we can actually see like how many downloads of each of these presentations, like which of these do people actually care about and which of these decks have just been languish languishing since, you know, our user conference five years ago. So we would love to, to get some data and analytics around that because obviously we only see it anecdotally, but I think for the most part, our leaders who have been at least in it for a while are really driving the narrative for their meetings based on what their members want. So after every event, uh, Bevy kicks back a survey to members and you know you can ask different questions about what did you like, what did you, where do we miss the mark, all of that kind of stuff. So I think that's the primary driver for content versus what's on, on the Trello board. But again, we wanna make sure folks don't feel paralyzed. So for me, I envision that board as being something for someone who's newer and doesn't know exactly <laughs> where to get started, but a great question because it is it is a challenge. And is, sorry, really quick follow-up question. Yeah. Is the content designed to be presented by anyone or does it kind of come with an attached speaker who then delivers that content? That's a great question. The content on that board specifically is sort of like, I can grab this no matter who I am and present on it. And we're pulling those decks from a variety, a variety of different places. Some of those decks have come from internal presentations that the Atlassian team has given and decided to share with the public. Some of it is content that their fellow leaders have created and decided to share uh, with the public, but um, that's kind of a grab and go. And then we have another Trello board where <laughs> internal Atlassian members or their fellow leaders can add a card and say, hey, I'm a subject matter expert in X topic and I'm ready, willing, and able to present at, at a virtual event. And so that's kind of a nice way where if you're like, eh, I'm not really interested in the content, I want like a real live human being who can like speak to it, we have a resource for that as well. Super cool, thank you. Yeah. Tony, you're on mute. Thank <laughs> um, So I asked Elijah if you want to share his comment just to make sure everyone uh, is uh, hearing this. Um. Yeah, you're, Eli yeah. here. So which yes. particular thing yeah, are you... Uh, yeah, I've been so typing a lot. <laughs> uh, about creating unique events. Um, like you had a tip here that you're coaching chapter Yeah, here. yeah, totally. So I, I have the same problem around like, you know, my events used to be unique because it was about a specific geography. But now that we're online, obviously that is not the thing that makes those events unique. Um, and so at the moment, uh, what I've really been coaching my local leaders to do is lean really hard into finding local case studies because part of the value of geography had always been that people want to see themselves and their peers in these events because they're like, oh, that's fine for that organization over in New York. But here I am in Vancouver and, and we're totally different. So the more I can bring in local case studies, the more I can still bring value and, and go niche into that geography, even if we're online. It, it hasn't been perfect, but it's, it's helping people focus their events a little. Definitely. Uh, great tip. Um, okay, so next next question um, is was uh, okay. So uh, Beth had a question and she does, she's not here, but I will ask it. Uh, how do you promote the event without overwhelming your audience? Um, are all events re relevant to your whole audience, and um, do you target emails to specific audience based on the event? I think it was uh, Nave you share you share that you are promoting the event uh, from your side. Yeah, no, don't worry. We don't spam everybody who uses Slack. I do try and put in like some parameters. So, like for example, our, 
um, if the event is going to be in English, to make sure that it's people who have English turned on. Um, often um, we'll put it for users that have over five seats. That normally means that it's a paid plan. It's really just to make sure that we're not going for absolutely everybody. Um, because also it tends to be that a lot of people who use the free plans are the ones who are already actively pursuing um, free events to attend and all of our events are already free. So we're just trying to get the people who don't know. So yeah, it's not, targeting everybody like today I put in a request for the Slack platform community in London they're hosting an event in the next few weeks and I put it so that it'll be just for people who are based within the UK and also in Ireland thank you and I can add by the way who is helping promote the, ch the uh, events from from the company uh, official uh, email like we do as well do anyone else do that Okay, um, great. Yeah, um, I think it's personal. I think it's very important, especially when it's local, when it was real local uh, in in person. Um, so a question for Erica. Um, it was my question. Do you know how much the percentage of leaders that go over the, imp the important resource that you're sharing as part of the onboarding process? Because I'm not sure my leaders are reading the, <laughs> the playbook. If that is not the bane of every community manager's existence, where you're like, I have documented everything, I have handed it to you on a silver platter, <laughs> and yet you are still asking me this question, which like is fine. And again, information overload. These are volunteers. They have a lot on their plate. So I think that is one of our biggest challenges, especially as the program grows. Like we're reaching, you know, 500 humans now is getting the right information to the right person at the right time. And so um, we, the leaders do have their own Slack instance that they hang out in. So that is one way we distribute information. So super important stuff we'll, we'll put in the announcements channel there. But we also know that not everyone is able to be in on Slack during the workday. You know, not all companies are, are about that life, even, we, even though we love it so much. So we have also introduced a twice monthly newsletter that is written and curated by me. It is kind of my like little passion project where I just kind of curate all of the latest and greatest links, threads, program information, kind of a, you may have missed this over the past two weeks kind of thing. And it is sent from my Gmail inbox. So, We've intentionally done that just so it can kind of skip some of the spam promo filters um, that can snag email news newsletters sometimes. I realize eventually that may not scale, but delivered twice monthly to their inbox, all the latest and greatest. And then we also post a copy of it online uh, in the leader uh, specific collection of the community. So it's kind of like if you're not getting it in the leader report, I don't know how to help you. <laughs> but it's tough. It is tough. Yes, uh, yeah, and again, I'm glad that I'm not the only one with this kind of problems. Um, and by the way, so you're responsible for the North America. Is the other uh, community manager that's responsible for EMA and APAC do the same, or, or it's not? The newsletter is pretty agnostic. Like it's just kind of like this is information that is relevant to the the leader group at large. So it's just one one email newsletter twice a month in your inbox. Okay. Um, okay, Matt, you have a question for Niv. How many leaders per location? Is there a minimum, maximum amount of leaders? Yeah, minimum one and maximum three. And we found that like any time it goes over three, that's when it's just chaos in the kitchen. So three kind of the absolute max, but like ideally two. They are not obliged to work together, although often when people are co-leading a chapter, they will be people who already know each other and will suggest somebody that they know within the city and be like, oh, we work together in events, we can work together. And then we won't actually open up a chapter if there's not a willing leader. And obviously the metrics to warrant it, but a leader first and foremost, so minimum one, max three. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and sorry, Matt, for stealing your. Um, um, no, perfect, you. <laughs> um, okay, so there, there is Ali's question. Um, Ali, uh, not Ali, sorry. Eli, do you want to ask? I apologize. 
no, he, okay, he, he's not here. Okay, fantastic. So I will, ask, uh, I will go to Danny. Hi, Danny. Um, please ask your question. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am new at my current role. Um, I'm about seven weeks in at Gloss Genius, and it is my first time working for a B2B software organization and also uh, being on the user acquisition side of um, how, how community fits into their structure. My previous job, as I mentioned in the chat, which I have uh, four years experience of being there. So it was a huge leap for me to leave this community that I totally tended and grew from, you know, ground zero. Um, that was a retail company, obviously. So the end result or end desire is for your ambassadors to help bring in more sales for those individual retail items. At Gloss Genius, this is an app that our community uses to improve their own personal business. And so ultimately my goal is user acquisition. And so that means just getting them to get out there and then you know be fruitful and multiply. Um, I'm curious if anyone else is working for an organization that is for profit and how community, or forgive me, but judging on your faces, maybe everyone is. Um, but I am really curious about how to keep incentivization creative and constantly changing when you are already going to be paying them for doing their job. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. When you say pay, paying them, you mean paying the, um, the ambassadors? Or Correct. So <laughs> our ambassadors are asked to share our product with their community and in return people sign up for the app through them and ultimately start off on a free trial but those become activated customers once they begin to subscribe themselves so um we pay them per activation when it works like that and it's a it's just a commission structure so um I guess is and does anybody else have a structure like that? I know I realize and I'm hearing a lot of your communities are very much volunteer based and ultimately holistic in the sense of we just want to keep people buzzing and really excited about what we're doing. Um, can anyone relate to that? Cool. Uh, Eric, yeah, Eric, I go. <laughs> I can't relate because like I said, we have this, this volunteer army of 400 angels from above who like are just intrinsically motivated to talk about Atlassian and, you know, share best practices with the world. But when you mention like perks and rewards and like incentivizing folks, that is something that is always top of mind for us. These people are reflecting a lot of value toward Atlassian and we want to make sure that that value is reflected back to them. And some of those perks and rewards are cost-based, like people are always going to be incentivized by swag. Um, they're always going to be incentivized by just like sending them things, little like surprise and delight, like a bottle of champagne for a new baby, like stuff like that. But there's a lot of stuff that we think about that doesn't cost us anything. So I think no matter how big or small, you know, your program really help elevate these people. So we have you know, quarterly content awards where we highlight the folks who are authoring awesome articles in our community. We have an end of the year annual awards where we recognize folks who have hosted the most events or have had held the most engaging events or the leader who's affected the most change, you know, within the program. So we search out those like recognition points because they tell us again and again that a lot of times that is the most important thing. Like they tell us they want behind the scenes access to the Atlassian team and they want to be recognized publicly for, you know, this extra effort. So I think that's sort of, you can apply that no matter whether you have a volunteer yeah. army or a paid army, there are ways to like elevate and sort of point out your rock stars that keep them coming back for more. I like that phrase paid army. <laughs> we're very much a gloss genius army and yeah. that's and we totally have this really pumped community that's already doing the work we're handpicking those who are superstars and rewarding them while incentivizing them to do more so 
that that totally tracks. Thank you so much for your yeah. advice and thanks for giving me a chance to ask a question. Yeah. Hey, before um, we move on uh, off that topic, can I just ask just it, for everyone? Uh, we're we definitely want to incentivize leaders and presenters, and then obviously just acknowledge people that have shown up to these events, and it will actually help our business to be able to see that who does what. Um, I've been kicking around an idea of some type of like ongoing leaderboard and not a leaderboard in the sense of, you know, every community, if you, if you do something, you get a point. If you say something, you get a point, but I wanted to create a separate one for like user groups in general, because that's my main focus. Does anyone have anything like that? like an ongoing leaderboard specifically for presenters, uh, attendees and, and leaders or um i love erica what you're talking about with the awards like quarterly and, and annually that's something that we could probably plug in right away but just curious if anyone has an ongoing type of user group reward leader board type of thing uh, i'm just kicking around to something we want to kind of do i'll say we we don't but we're working on it as well uh we want each group in addition to leaderboards to have like a trophy case that's sort yeah. of like you, you go into the group and it's got just like a list of like how long has the group's been active, how many members, how many events, some of those things to kind of gamify the group's experience, not just for leaders, but for the group as a whole to go yeah. further. Um, trying to figure out some of those intangible benefits because sa same thing, like even though we're for profit, we currently can't get approval to purchase crinkle paper to ship the right. swag we do have. <laughs> it's sitting in a warehouse somewhere. So, um, we're also trying to provide benefits to leaders that are like of career benefit to them. So we'll do like, we've started doing leader options where we have a speaker and we'll do like leadership development uh, talks and things like that to kind of give them a boost in other areas of their career for serving as a leader for our groups. Yeah, we're kicking around badges too. So they can maybe even put that badge on their LinkedIn. Like I'm a community leader badge on my LinkedIn or something like that. So cool. Awesome. I'm excited. Thanks for, it's a great group. I'm excited to be a part of it. I can share just a <laughs> tiny bit about what we do. So uh, we have this on the chapter level. We have gold points and gold status. And so there are various different things that chapters do to earn gold points. And then once they reach a thousand points in a given year, we do it every year, they get gold status. And there are lots of chapters who are like, we've had gold status for 17 years. Um, we also have a chapter of the year program, which is a different kind of thing. Um, but you know, I, uh, the the points thing, like ours, is on a chapter level. Um, but it's it works pretty well, and there are a surprising number of people who are like, "Well, how many gold points do we get by doing this kind of thing?" Um, even though there's not like, if you reach gold status, you get a thousand dollars or anything like that. It's mostly pride and and like a like a we don't. We're trying to also have the digital trophy case, but they will do it themselves right now. Sam, can you share with us the criteria for, um, uh, for the yes, cleaning? It's, it's in that, if I can find it in that chapter leader hub, because that's where we put everything. Fantastic. So, uh, very good. Um, so just adding- By the way, so, oh, sorry, Tali. No, no, go, go. This idea of making not making encouraging our chapter leaders to compete against one another i might be stealing that if and when our team goes beyond two people <laughs> see and sam has just proved my theory that ultimately these playbooks and guides are more for us than for our members yes i'm going to look I mean, when i need something i'm going to look there and then uh, <laughs> to find it um i wanted to say this to danny that the type of program you mentioned so i work for elementor and it's something it's called affiliates and we have it under marketing because this is what I, they're doing from day uh, from uh, the first day they have this um um youtubers and uh, um super super users or superstar that are speaking to their communities and getting paid for each purchase um with something that we we of, of course working with them uh, with the, the marketing team, with the affiliate team, but it's something that is there uh, because we're doing, we're working with volunteers uh, as um, uh, this is like our goal. So it's separated in, in our company. 
Absolutely. I've been working on how to identify the different species of partners that we work with because it's, it's so important to differentiate. We actually have, so I will be owning the ambassador program, which is our MVP users who, like I said earlier, are performing really well already. We want to incentivize them to do further. This is not a multi level marketing or pyramid scheme situation. However, you do get paid for the amount of users you bring in. Um, but as far as affiliates, that's a whole other wing and influencers are a whole other wing too. So it's really, I think it depends on the organization, um, but you're you're totally right and it's totally up that alley. I actually have to hop off and I'm gonna put my LinkedIn in the chat and I would love to connect with all of you and we'll stay in touch. Fantastic. So make uh, make sure to join the Slack uh, the Slack channel for chapters and the group for next event. It was great seeing you. Um, thank you for joining today. Um, Eli, do you want to ask? Uh, you had some questions during the um, during the talks. Do you want to ask something? Do you see the chat? Yes, that part I can get into. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I have one of the questions, but just so I've seen several of you have got like these these stages as part of the onboarding, where he's basically tracking sort of a sales funnel. And I'm just curious to say, like, as you pe move people through those funnels, where do you typically see people get stuck? Like, what's the hard part in your onboarding? <laughs> you capture um, all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say we see the most tension or like the biggest pain points when it comes to because as a events leader you can be reimbursed for when we were doing in-person events you could be reimbursed up to fifteen dollars a person for pizza beer you know whatever choose your own adventure um and just literally the logistics of like setting up banking information between like the leader and like atlassian internally is just like nightmare time especially when you talk about like international you know, banking account information and whatever. So get tripped up a lot there. I think there isn't really an easier way to do that. I think as we think about scaling, that is one thing that I would love someone to figure out how to make that like a little bit easier, but it's kind of where we're at right now. And it's a necessary step, obviously, before you host your first event, you want to have that set up. Mm -hmm. So if you get stuck there, you kind of have to push through it and, and move on. But that was the that was the first thing that came to mind because it is such a pain in the neck. I totally feel your pain. I've often like got stuck in the same place and setting up a bank transfer for a hundred dollar transaction is insanity. Yes. So does everybody um, give allocate money towards their leaders? We we don't. We've never have. We have uh, say hey, here's a list of people that are dying. <laughs> dying to be a part of it they want to sponsor location they want to sponsor food uh yeah i we what, don't do that what so what uh, where do you work with what is your community oh sorry workday sorry i work at workday and i run a global program of 150 user groups it's a it's a little different than what you guys are describing but um we are changing platforms and our current platform that we use for community is ancient and so i'm so excited that we're changing platforms. Uh, what are we going to use? Oh, yeah. Um, I want to say it's, uh, sorry, I have it here. They are just in the works. Uh, Koros, I believe, is what we're changing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but yeah, we've never, we've never given any cash toward it. So I just wanted to see if that's the normal. We do give a budget, but it's not like giving cash. Um, it's very much that it's it can vary between cities but there's like a rule of thumb it's about one hundred thousand dollars per year per chapter but that goes on like if they needed to rent a space so needless to say basically nobody used it or touched it at all last year but if they want to have like swag incentivizations for their run like run a competition and get people to join or just to send swag to their speakers that will come out of their budget as well so it's like food and beverage but since that's a non-runner swag as much swag as you want to send to your leader or to your um chapter go wild with it one thousand dollars worth of socks coming your way but you are doing the processing are you doing yeah. the processing you transferring the money to <laughs> yeah um so no 
sorry, uh, how it works is they'll put in the request of what they want and then I'll work with the swag vendor, which by the way, in Europe, post-Brexit, mid-pandemic, nightmare. But yeah, so they go through us. One thing that may help, <clears throat> sorry, I'm not talking a lot because my allergies are horrible, so sorry about my voice. But um, one thing that may help some of you that I used in, um, I had a, a community first nonprofit that I launched and they were very scattered. So we had a volunteer team all over the place. Some were enough to get sponsorships. So what I did is I started purchasing Amazon gift cards and then um, I could digitally just send them an Amazon gift card and they could, it was easy to track and um, keep tabs on what chapters were spending what and they could source their supplies there. So it's just an idea. Nice. Thank you, Amanda. Do you want to share anything about uh, yourself, about your uh, organization? Um, well, I, I started a community based uh, it was a kind of an interesting, odd thing that I did. Um, nonprofit on Facebook. I started with a Facebook group in 2012, which led into me creating um, geo-based sections of that Facebook group by need, which turned into a national nonprofit that serves globally now. Um, so I, I founded that, I led that <clears throat> for a number of years. And um, I left last year, I'm also a nurse, and um, I've been busy with other things. Um, and I just started a consulting firm that is really focused on community. I was selected in 2017 when Facebook did their whole um, refocus on community. Um, and Mark was did his whole live stream. I was one of the 100 people he selected to be in the room that day as one of the top community developers. I got that experience and I got to bring two of my volunteers uh, in the nonprofit out. And so that's when I got seriously interested in community. Um, and so I've been in it since then and exploring it. And now I'm uh, working with those people, some of the women that helped me develop the nonprofit and we're looking at how we can use community to bring empathy and um, real meaningful connections to the online space. And um, I'm working with some high-end influencers. Um, and so it's, I'm getting into the for-profit side, but I wanted to bring my, my version of um, my calling into that and um, do things differently and bring some entrepreneurship into this game. So that's what I'm doing here. Fantastic. It's a very interesting um, um, journey. But I'm also you getting had... these, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but with, was it Danny that was here and saying that they're doing new things? I'm also a, a business strategist, so I am intersecting community strategy and business strategy. So I am building right now community businesses, different people in several different industries, and I'm getting a lot of these you're going to see more of this, I think, in the future. Um, I think we're moving into a new time with community, and I'm I'm being asked to build communities with these new approaches of um, monetization in new ways, and that this is coming down the pike. And I'm now I'm. This is my other room of my madness of drafting how this is going to work and how we're going to get paid in new ways and how we're going to be um, taking portions of the money streams that we're creating for people. So um, these are the projects I'm working on and nonprofits, you know, I collected, I, I sourced all the funding for my nonprofit from Facebook. Um, and so th there's just new, there's new pathways and I'm excited to be part of the Part of what's happening so i'm excited to meet you guys and thank, thank you very much i think that it'll you're be here. interesting yeah not to just work for people but to have our own businesses and, and create new pathways is what i'm interested in definitely thank definitely you. thank you um so more questions i know that we had more questions during the way 
Mm, no, my um, okay, so Isabella, you want to ask something? Hi, you haven't spoken today? I, I have not. I'm a lurker today. Um, no, I appreciate this opportunity as I um, just joined Udacity. I'm not sure if anyone has heard of it. It's an online education platform and I am on the scholarships community team. So we're working with students that come in um, and they go through what we call a challenge phase. Um, and then we award a specific number of those who pass the challenge phase, a free nano degree moving forward. So the way we run things is just a bit different than what others are describing because we have to build community from the ground up for every new scholarship program. Not sure if that's the best way to do things, but I'm new around here. So I'm taking things in and, and learning new things from different groups to hopefully maybe implement on our end because with us, we have what we call student leaders. So within a two or three month period, we have to get these student leaders up and running. They can help us manage upwards of 15,000 students, which comes with its own set of challenges, getting leaders up to speed and then having to say goodbye to them three months later. So I love the organization that I've seen today because we often also fall victim to noting everything and having beautiful web pages for our leaders to go to and then no one uses them. Um, and it's just us asking or answering the same question at every AMA session. So um, I'm again, just like happy to be here and take all the information from the community pros and hopefully I'll have something to add down the line, but, but that's it for today, just in taking it all in and hopefully bring back some of these golden nuggets of information to, to our community space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so a general question for everyone. Uh, how often do you contact uh, with your leaders? Like not um, not written communication, but uh, video call. Do you set up a video call for each period of time to check in, to make sure they are alive or uh, OK? Um, a great question. Um, I think one of our most important roles as community managers for programs like this is to be a gatekeeper for these humans to make sure that we are communicating effectively, but not like over communicating with them, right? Like, again, these are volunteers. They have families and lives that have nothing to do with Atlassian. So we are cognizant of that. Um, in terms of like actual video chats, we have monthly coffee chats across three different time zones. So folks can hop in, say, hi, hello, you know, how's it going? Talk a little bit about Atlassian, but it's mostly intended to be like a social hour. Um, and then it's mostly kind of ad hoc. Like I would say we don't have specific like video chat milestones built into the leader journey. journey. It's kind of like, an open door whenever folks need to chat with us. I'd say probably the video calls come into play more when folks are in an at-risk category and we kind of want to check in and see like, how are we doing? You know, are there any barriers we can remove for you? How can we get you re-engaged? You know, that kind of thing. But the folks who are active and engaged, we're chatting with them in Slack. We're, you know, seeing them in the coffee chats. They're showing up to different workshops and trainings. So we keep a pretty good pulse check that way. Fantastic. Anyone else doing something? Similar enough, but also like you're trying to be aware of global things going on. So like Nigeria was having a tough time last year and it was just when we'd onboarded the Lagos chapter. So it was our first chapter in Nigeria and they, had, they kept sending me messages apologizing for not hosting events and like guys, please. And same in Belarus, people apologizing for being, you know, otherwise engaged. And it's like, no, 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 don't, please don't worry. And same with like the chapters in India at the moment, there's enough going on. So I try to keep regularly in chat with them, obviously in Slack, um, but it's only the ones that are like super duper quiet are the ones that I try to get on video call. Um, but apart from that, just because you know i'm home all day long looking at walls and occasionally my flatmate whenever they're like would you mind get up on the call like, yeah do you want to talk now i'm ready <laughs> right now so 
fairly available to talk. Um, that's fantastic. I have to say that I had uh, we are asking our leaders to do monthly or bi monthly uh, meetups, and they uh, agree when accepting accepting the program. Uh, but I realized that there are some that I need. They, they got getting lost. Um, so I started doing quarterly uh, calls with some of them. I hadn't catch up to make it with everyone. Uh, of course, if I had an interaction with them during other sessions, uh, we will. One second, sir. <laughs> uh, I'm working from home, and I have a <laughs> my son just came in. I'll, I'll jump in and give her a minute. I just want to, one thing that was really important about this that I learned um, with the nonprofit was we had so many people that fell off grid and it was because like they changed their email or they changed their uh, messenger account address. So we learned to go through and do an audit and sometimes just picking up the old fashioned phone was really important and we could recapture 20% of our dead leads. We call them dead leads, right? Which were that had just gone away. But the way that you reach out, don't rely on the most common way that you connected with somebody as being the only way. They may have changed, you know, whatever contact information is on, on that one particular channel. So go to all the channels and get all the contact information when you sign them up go back to that it's easy to be complacent just a tip uh, thanks amanda i'm um, sorry for the interruption um yeah yes you really think that in some cases like our business it's, it's global people and if i will take if i will call them it's like i will violating a privacy something but we do use slack and emails and um and, and in the end it's working uh, but yeah, I like discovered that uh, making a stronger connection um, sometimes it's it's necessary again when when we can do that. So we have the last five minutes. Um, we have. Um, do you want to share the next event? Yeah, I would love to talk a little bit about the next event um, because the next event is where I put you to work. That's right. You know, because it's a community event, and therefore we're going to put you to work. Although, you know, I can see today has been obviously you're super engaged. So, what we're going to do is it's going to be a lot of five minute demos where we're going to basically show off our favorite like community manager tools and life hacks. So, no slides, no complication. Um, what it really is going to be is you're going to come and say, like, here's like this super cool listening dashboard I use, or here's how I remember to follow up with my leaders. And you can just say, like, here it is. Look how cool this is. Well, I'll ooh and ah, think you're amazing. Um, and then we have both we'll, like bang the dong, the gong, and we'll move on. So it's going to be fast paced. It's going to be just a chance for you to learn all kinds of interesting tools. And I will probably pre schedule about three or four of you just to start to break the ice. But my experience is afterwards, then that's basically me trying to shut you up because you're all going to say, like, but look at this cool thing I can do. Um, and that will be the flow of the event. So it'll be a little informal, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. And if you want to be one of those initial people, if you've got a thing you think we should all know about, this is where you should put something into the chat and I will hunt you down and we will get that little demo in there just to start things off. Um, but the rest of you, you don't need to do too much pre prep because in the moment you will be inspired. I'm waiting, waiting for this event. Uh, I'm sure that's going to be fantastic. I have a lot of small, small stuff. <laughs> uh, so you can reach out to uh, Eli on CMX Slack or uh, throughout the chapter, I think, like the connect, contact us button there. And if Eli wants to share his email or something. So um, OK, and we're always doing uh, the event on the first Wednesday of the month, the first or the second, let me check, it's the, yeah, it's uh, the first. I hope you had a great time today. Thank you very much uh, for Erica and even Sam for your, uh, for sharing with us your uh, expert experience. Um, anyone want to say last word for now? Thanks for having us, Tani. This is yeah. fun. That was CEO. Yeah.
thanks. Thanks for letting yeah. me share and for everybody else sharing and asking questions too. Fantastic. So uh, have a great evening, day, morning, uh, <laughs> and we'll see you next month. And I will, uh, we will post uh, the recording also on the chapters group channel and maybe do like a summary or something. Um, and I will, we will think about that. Thank yeah, you, everyone. We'll see how much work we want to take on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, enduring. It's fun. Uh, thanks, guys. Have